How are we doing? <laughs> this one will go in a minute. Shall I set it off? I first met the photographer Steve Shipman in 2013. He came on a photography workshop I was hosting about still images and sound combined. Actually, it was the first workshop I'd hosted for photographers. I'd been shooting professionally less than a decade. He'd been photographing considerably more. He was the ninth name to book on, and I made some notes about him. I wrote, very proficient photographer, really nice chap too. But Steve is so much more than that, which you'll gather by the supporting gallery of celebrities on the show notes page. I'm sure he wooed with that beautifully disarming nature of his. Keanu Reeves, Sir Anthony Hopkins, Baroness Thatcher. Actually, I could spend the next half hour just reading names from his who's who list of well-known personalities and historical figures, so I'm rather pleased if a little embarrassed he granted me his considerably proficient time back in 2013 because, although I didn't know it then, I just fortuitously bumped into a one-in-a-million type person. I think if you asked anyone lucky enough to be his friend, he'd probably find one word appear more than any other when prompted to describe this really nice chap. Generous. Because despite all the people he's photographed, the stories he's told, the newspapers and magazines that have shared his work all over the globe, and even the fact seven photographs of his feature within the National Portrait Gallery's collection, arguably the most important British archive for photographers and photography. Despite all that, he was never too busy if you called. I never heard him belittle, run down or decry another's work or, most importantly, passion for the business or art of photography. And whilst nobody can be that perfect, I'm sure, if you ever did partake in that thumbs-down style depreciation that's become a new and sadly accepted currency of social discourse, he'd just disarm you with a glint in his eye and knowing look that says, are you sure you don't want to rephrase that last sentence into something, well, kinder? This week's podcast guest is Steve. Steve Shipman, a very proficient photographer and a really nice chap too. Do you remember your first camera? Yes, I do. It was a, a Canon FTB. And it came about because I had a job on a building site for my first sort of summer holiday as a 16-year-old. And I earned a fortune. I earned enough money to buy a really good camera and a really good hi-fi system. And actually, to be honest, I used the hi-fi system far more once I'd bought it than I did the camera. Um, the camera stayed on the shelf for months afterwards before I sort of thought, mm, maybe I should have a go with it, otherwise it is wasted money. I wasn't really heading in any direction, really. I know my dad would have liked me to have had a proper job with a salary. Um, but um, I was artistic, I liked drawing, I liked designing things, I drew cars endlessly. Um, but I tried out the camera and we had a pet dog and of course I photographed the dog and then I photographed flowers in the garden and then we went for a walk and I photographed ducks by the lake. I've still got the pictures actually, I can show you them if you want. Um, and it was a revelation, it really was, because um, particularly the shot of our golden retriever, the clarity of the lens, the inadvertent shallow depth of field, because I had no idea what I was doing, uh, really brought the picture to life and I was transfixed at that moment with that picture. What about inspiration, the, those people in your life that say, yes, you can do this? I was lucky enough to have an enlightened art master in a very, otherwise very academic school who I could ask about photography. And I said, I showed him a Vogue magazine, actually. And I said, do people earn money doing this? Is it possible to earn a living taking photos? And he said, yes. He had a nephew who was a commercial photographer. He said, absolutely it is. And my path was set. Most of the London photographers that I knew about, the commercial photographers, had assistants. Most of them had studios, full-time assistants. Some of them had a PA working with them. They all had agents and they were big names. And I was lucky enough to work for one of them. He was a passionate photographer. He was very creative, very intuitive. Everything he did was off the cuff. You never knew what you were going to be shooting that day or how you were going to be shooting it. Um, he made a lot of use of outdoor lighting. He was just a maverick, really. Um, he gave me a fantastic grounding in all sorts of work. Portraits, still lives. I do have a story about a still life I shot for him, and I'll tell you this quickly. A friend of his had made a folding room screen, a three-part room screen that you'd put up to change behind, for example. Very beautiful thing, made of Japanese silk. 
He'd asked Graham to photograph it. Graham said, you do it, you know. So I set it up on a nice backdrop, lit it nicely, so you can see all the shapes and the colours of the screen. And Graham said, hold it right there. We're going to hang a light bulb in front of it, a bare light bulb. So he did that, and he looped the light wire so that there was a, a circle in it. Just a little artistic touch, very typical of him. We shot it on 5.4. I ran the film down to the lab, waited for it to be processed, ran it back to him thinking, that looks great. Put it on the light box. And he said, where's the loop in the wire? And I looked at it again, and the wire had swung round. So the loop was straight onto the camera, and I hadn't noticed. And I said, I'm really sorry. He said, you're looking, but you're not seeing. And that was a lesson. Photography has changed my history completely. I've been a photographer shooting on film and I've seen that change into shooting on digital. In the days of shooting film, I remember crowding around light rooms at Joe's Basement or Metro um, and everybody was very guarded. They'd look at the picture, you know, you can't look at my stuff. You know, how'd you get that effect? I'm not telling you. It was all terribly guarded. And I've never felt that way inclined. I've always wanted to share my ideas. And digital, in this digital age of sharing everything, it's a gift. And I think, you know, being able to share ideas and techniques with other photographers is something I really enjoy doing. How are we doing? <laughs> this one will go in a minute. Shall I set it off? That one's next. <laughs> What's a Steve Shipman photograph? I like symmetry in a photo. I like clean lines. I love things that are just balanced. So there's an element in the frame which corresponds with something else in the frame that makes it even. So I like simplicity. Um, in my portraits, I've always gone for strong headshots. I believe that expressions convey huge amounts of meaning. And in my wedding work, I try to keep shots uncluttered where possible. So there's a clear background, or we use depth of field to blur the background so the subject stands out. And your own work? In my personal work, which I shoot a bit of these days, sort of street photography, I look for shapes and lines. And again, I'm looking for balance and symmetry, light and dark. And I suppose that's more of the signature for my kind of thing. Uh, a lot of photographers I know love busy, cluttered pictures, and I do like looking at them, but I don't tend to take them myself. Sometimes it's the positioning of the subject that well, obviously it will affect the photo. Margaret Thatcher gave me her situation. She said, we're going to shoot it here, and so I had to shoot it right there. So not my ideal scenario. But again, it's a simple situation. There's a, there's a wall with some, you know, balustrade behind her or something. It's fairly soft and nondescript, so she stands out from the background nicely. So I was happy with that. And a lot of my celebrity headshots are quite simple. They're on plain backgrounds. Occasionally there were moments where we had agents and minders and assistants sort of looking at their watches and saying, you know, you've got five more minutes, 30 seconds. I remember doing Claudia Schiffer, dream job in those days. She was a big named model. She just put out a DVD, a Keep Fit DVD, and we were photographing her in a hotel, as one does, and she would not take the DVD down from beside her face. There was no way I was going to get my clean headshot of her, beautiful as she is. She held it there, or she held it there, or it was there. It might have been like that. She would not budge, and that was such a shame. But a lot of the time, my subjects were more than willing to stand in front of me and just be themselves, and that is the most important thing. I did a picture of Dustin Hoffman, which was very early on in my series of black and white portraits, as it became. And he said, well, what do you want me to do? And I said just look at me and he just looked at me and I got the most brilliant revealing real portrait of him which to this day I'm very proud of. I was very lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I was one of about a dozen photographers that all those magazines used all the time and the art director of the Radio Times actually said to me once whenever you're not shooting ring me and we'll give you a job. I was lucky to be that busy for about 15 years and it it was a fabulous time for me. We were very fortunate with this was before I had the children. Um, so Amanda and I really did very well in those early days. In fact, it enabled me to buy the studio ultimately. Without wishing to plunder well-worn cliches or seasoned chestnuts, it does seem fitting that Steve's Behind Each Great Man story features a woman he's been with since teenage years. I met Amanda at 
a Saturday night church hall disco, as they used to be called. I'd just finished my Saturday job, actually. Uh, I was, my mum and dad suggested that I might like to study a bit more for my O-levels. And um, so I stopped the job and went out that night with a mate from the shop I'd worked in to see what we could do. And I saw this girl dancing on the dance floor and she looked lovely. She was just absorbed in her own, you know, movements and just having a lovely time. And I thought, she looks, she looks nice. <laughs> in my sort of little 16 year old, my nearly 16 year old, I was 15 still. So I did pluck up the courage to go and say, you're a great dancer, would you like a drink? And she said, no thanks, I've just had one. Which would have flattened any less keen young man. But I said, well, I'm having a drink, come and, have a, come and be with me anyway. And she did, bless her. And anyway, we got to know each other and she was 14 that summer and I was just about to be 16. So this was in the September. Uh, I was 16 in the October. And bar one year gap while we were at uni, we've been together ever since. What is it about Amanda? <laughs> She's a very strong, wise woman. We talk a lot. We walk and talk a lot. It's something we've always done, with or without a dog. We've walked and talked. And that's the strength, I think, of our relationship. We just talk through everything. We always have done. What is it about her? She's a very wise, understanding, considerate and patient person. She's kept us together as a family. She's the glue that does hold us together. She's an absolute pillar of strength for the girls. And she's the rock for me. You're listening to Breathe Pictures, a show about photography and photographers, filmmaking and filmmakers. My thanks as always to EpidemicSound.com for their beautiful soundtracks that really add a further dimension to these interviews. Today's Breathe Pictures podcast guest is the photographer Steve Shipman, and I'm sure, or rather I'd hope he'd forgive my clumsy suggestion, that he may just be one of the most successful photographers you've never heard of. If you rate success by how many pound notes you're in possession of, how many mark cars litter your driveway, or how many commercial sponsorship deals carry your name, then perhaps it'd be true to suggest you could be judging success at F1.2 if you catch my drift. And then we come back to Steve's very calm and experienced generosity. Someone once said to me that to succeed in business, you have to bring out your inner Jack Russell. The terrier side that doesn't let go when he's caught a scent. Tough beyond your apparent physical size. But actually, that's not completely true, I think. Because far from that rather tired absurdity that suggests good guys don't win, Steve is proof that being a really nice chap and all actually goes a long way to bring out the best and most honest in people. An attribute he used well when faced with what showbiz refers to as the talent. So occasionally in the days of celebrity photography, I would approach people myself and ask them if I could photograph them for this series. And Leslie Crowther was one of the characters that I hadn't been asked to photograph for a magazine, but I got in touch with him. And he was such a lively character because he was a very successful te children's television presenter. And I wanted to capture that in this portrait of him. And if you look closely, you can see his hand has actually moved during the exposure, which was deliberate, because I wanted to convey that sense of, oh, I don't know, manic movement that he's so known for, or was known for, uh, when he was on stage. So Joan Collins was a commission for the Sunday Express magazine. It's one of a series of portraits of women taken in a nightclub in London called Annabelle's. And for this portrait, we set up lots of lights, lots of background, it was very glamorous. And the original went off in colour to the magazine and I kept this black and white back for me. And I'm particularly pleased with it. She took hours in makeup, but eventually appeared 
and sat very graciously for my camera. And as I say to a lot of my subjects, just look at me. And she gave me just the most beautiful look and she's got the most beautiful arm and face. And you know, she's no spring chicken, but she looks really good in this photograph and I'm really pleased with it. It was always a delight to photograph a celebrity who arrived on his own, as he did. So many celebrities arrived with their managers and their agents and their assistants. And he turned up as if he was just a, a, a humble actor, you, you know, having appeared in his first film. In I fact, you know, Sir Anthony Hopkins poet, um, graced our presence in the studio. And I just, once again, I asked him to be himself in front of my camera. He thought it was very odd that I asked him to put his Macintosh raincoat back on because I loved the textures in it. And I just said, look at me. This is a good example of a picture that needed no direction whatsoever. This is a very angry Lenny Henry on the set of a TV production that he was involved in, starring as an angry young man. But he did not enjoy the process of uh, having to endure publicity photography. So I had about 30 seconds with him uh, in which he stood in front of the camera, glared at me and then walked away. I was asked to photograph Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer for a Sunday magazine. Please welcome your host for this evening, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer. And a day or two beforehand, I was able to ring them and ask them if they wanted me to bring in any props. So off the top of their heads, they just said, um, some stuffed animals and some salamis. So although there's no salami in this picture, there is a stuffed crocodile. And for about two and a half hours, I and my assistant were the audience for their two-man show. We were very fortunate. We had a good sort of 10 years or so at our careers. I was establishing myself as a photographer. She worked for a TV company at the time. And then we decided to start our family. And of course, at that time, I thought, well, I'm going to buy a studio as well and move house. So <laughs> all within a few months, um, Amanda gave birth to Eleanor, our oldest daughter. Uh, I bought the studio and we moved house. And um, that was a, you know, followed by a few traumatic years, I have to say. Maddie arrived three years later. And, um, and we did have, it was, I mean, God, it was a lot of fun. They were fantastic daughters and we enjoyed every second with them. Eleanor is very artistic. She's very ambitious, very focused on what she wants. She's very fussy and very particular. I know she won't mind me saying. Maddie is very uh, gregarious and outgoing. She loves a party. She's got hundreds of friends. And somehow that mix of Eleanor's sort of uh, intellectual intensity meshes with Maddie's ebullience and they get on very, very well indeed. And we are very blessed with that. So I talked earlier about the kind of shots I like to take and these are a good example of how I like symmetry in a picture. So almost every one of these has a balancing element on each side of the subject. Um, to convey partly the atmosphere of the room, those who are present, but also to set a stage for something that's happening right in the middle of each picture. So this poor groom who's absolutely in tears here, just behind him, out of focus, walks his lovely bride up to, to meet him. And I love the framing of that because he's in slightly to one side, but she's out of focus. So your eye automatically swaps between the two of them. A famous photographer called Henri Cartier-Bresson talked about the decisive moment. Apprendre à regarder, quoi, c'est de aller au Louvre et de voir, je sais pas, de voir les... And very often in weddings, you are waiting for a moment where the action is at its peak. The prefix wedding next to photography would have some seasoned professionals running for the proverbial hills. If you spend any time photographing grown-up stuff like fashion, editorial, conflict or sport, then surely the idea of embracing folk exchanging nuptials wouldn't be at the forefront of your photographic aspiration. Not so. I think wedding photography is intense, but I've been used to long days of photography anyway. And most of the editorial, and some of the corporate, but most of the editorial I shot was a one-off chance. You only had the one chance to photograph the Prime Minister or that actor because he was in the country or that person because they weren't available any other time. And weddings are similar. You have the same pressure because it's a non-repeatable event. You don't, you don't have another chance to go back and reshoot it. 
and I didn't with the work I'd done professionally beforehand. So I was used to the pressure and I was used to the long days. I was used to being alert and up upbeat for that many hours until the job was done and then you can sag and have a cup of tea. But um, I was used to the pressure so it didn't bother me at all. I recorded these thoughts from Steve about his work and family at the start of spring 2017, four years almost to the day after first meeting him and a month after receiving what I think of as that phone call from one of his dearest friends and colleagues, Phil, with the news that Steve was unwell. And without wishing to be too descriptive, the kind of unwell that forces words to whisper, as if to deny they'd been uttered at all. And so, Steve's film is a legacy in some respects, but the beauty of this thing that we do, making photographs, and then making stories from those fractions of a second for which the shutter is opened, is such that whatever nature throws down as a gauntlet can't deny what we've made, that the absoluteness of a still-captured moment remains just that, forever. Coming up to the year 2000, I was thinking about the millennium and special projects and things that were significant at that time. And I was literally sitting in the bath when I had the idea to do a series of portraits of my extended family. And I decided that it might be fun to have everybody holding something that meant something to them, a significant object. So we ended up shooting individual portraits of 50 or so people each holding something, and then we wrote a few words about it to sort of complete the portrait. I think personal projects are important for me now. There was a time when I was shooting professionally when I didn't have the energy. The weekends, I just wanted to be away from photography. Our summer holiday photos were taken by my wife, and I was, you know, I was tired. But these days, I, I feel a bit more enthusiastic. It's partly because of the digital revolution. I think it's transformed how we work our ownership of our pictures, we can process them how we want to, the sharing idea, which I mentioned earlier, talking with each other about how we do things, has been fantastic. And I love the community aspect of, of shooting personal work. You can go out with people and take pictures on the street, and it's just great to compare ideas and think about stuff that you shoot together. So my personal work is mostly street photography. It's very rarely people. I'm not a bold street photographer. I don't find photographing people on the street very easy. I find it a bit confrontational. So my street photography tends to be looking for light, looking for shadows, looking for balance, looking for colours. And that is the direction I've found that pleases me most. And I post them in a personal journal on my website. From Tales of the Street and your Micro Stories blog, a couple of years ago you revisited the idea of photographing your your living family tree again. What was the reason behind that? Partly motivated by some of our relatives becoming quite elderly. So here we have in the second volume, done in 2015, my daughter Eleanor, proudly holding her notebooks that she has collected and filled over the years of being an art student and subsequently working as a professional artist. Slightly different format with these pictures. I shot them on a 35 millimeter equivalent digital camera and this is shot in her now hometown of Bristol. Maddie lived at the time we shot this in Brighton, which she absolutely loved. She was also a very keen runner. So this is what she says. After much debate about what to hold as my thing for this project, I came to the conclusion that I have no current thing, I'm just doing my thing. And in many ways that does sum up Maddie so much. She very much and heartily does her thing. So to commemorate the completion of this book, we staged a big family party in a hall and invited everybody. And amazingly, everybody came. I referenced that call I received prior to making this film, which became this podcast. I'll share links in the show notes, of course, for the film version. Steve had been diagnosed in April 2017 with an aggressive cancer, and at the time, the news of that, coupled with a prognosis grimly revealing months rather than years, there seemed to be an urgency to make this feature. When I'd first met Steve, years back, we'd met because of the medium of sound. We'd talked about recording voices, we'd talked about the power of that in terms of legacy. And now, here we were, in his Hertfordshire home, recording his thoughts, but neither of us brave enough to use the L word. Surely this was all a mistake. As Steve wrote in his microstory blog called A Grim New Reality on April 25th, 2017, I'm angry. I'm a reasonably fit guy. I walk and cycle all the time and always have. 
My weight has been 64 kilos all my adult life. I have a glass of red wine most evenings. I've never smoked, never taken drugs, and I've always eaten good food with fresh, often organic ingredients. Cancer is indiscriminate for sure. But like everything I know and love about Steve, he tackled this, from the outside looking in at any rate, with a gentle, unwavering, steady calm. Chemo, a change of diet, visits to the naturopath, dandelion and burdock decoctions, cannabis oil and cycling. There was always cycling. He was rather proud of the fact he had a body mass index identical to the internationally acclaimed cyclist of Bradley Wiggins. Steve, you're having us all on, we'd say, as he thought nothing about clocking another 50-mile cycle ride that week for fun. And as the months of 2017 became 18, Steve was faring remarkably well. I returned to show him the film in edit stage only. In the back of my mind, I thought, if I never actually finish this, Steve will have to just keep sending me pictures and stay alive so I can add it to the eventual finished film one day. We had lunch late March 2018. We had one of his famous soup lunches. Amanda Josh that he may well have an identical BMI to an Olympian and Tour de France winner, but he could do with putting a few pounds on now. As I went to drive off from our afternoon together, Steve darted out from the house and asked to make a portrait. Now, I've seen his portraits of Sir Anthony Hopkins, personal hero of mine. I couldn't get out the car fast enough. Somewhere on an SD card in a small digital rangefinder-styled camera, there's a portrait that Steve made of me. And here's where the story ends. Because, and this does seem ironic, on a family cycle ride to an old nuclear strike base now reclaimed by herds of well-fed cattle and conservation and a cycle track to many, as I sat with my family on a picnic rug bathing in the sunshine of early summer and chomping on sandwiches and sausage rolls, I got that call. The second now of those calls from Steve's good friend Phil. Steve had passed, at home, as he wished, with his family by his side. Only a week or so prior, I'd received a text from Steve, which I've left on my phone all this time, purposefully awaiting the making of this podcast. And in typical Steve fashion, he guided conversation back to the receiver of his text. How are you? What are you working on? Apart from weddings. S. With two trademark kisses. Being a photographer is a great enabler. It has allowed me into people's lives. It's allowed me to connect with people. It's allowed me to reconnect people. And it has allowed me to be with people. People I love, people who I like being with, people who interest me, and people who just have interesting lives in their own ways. It's been a great privilege to be a photographer, and I don't regret a sing single second of my career. I've enjoyed every minute. I'll miss it. You don't have to be smart. No need to dress up for me to see that you're a good man, you're a good man, a real good man. When the wind blows and the windows are closing, you Chopping wood can be romantic. Sipping coffee under the apple tree is gentlemanly. Well, you're a good man, quite the best man, a real fine man.
You can read more of Steve Shipman's micro stories on his blog, which is still there to enjoy. My thanks to EpidemicSound.com and Velvet Moon for Good Man. More stories soon. Breathe Pictures.